good morning to all of you. Welcome back to the round table. Uh, we have, uh, uh, in continuation of yesterday's discussion, two specific uh, topics. Of course, first is the um, impact of Iranian oil and in the Indian energy scenario. There was some discussion of it yesterday, and you could also um, overhear that there is no there is no consensus on that on that on that issue. Some people said it is 1.5 percent. Some other person said no, it's only 0.5 percent. So it's not it's not clear exactly uh, what is our dependence on Iranian oil. But I at least as a as a layman, I do believe that we are not independent of the Iranian oil. That much is very clear. But how much it is something is worth uh, looking at. And that was one thing which needs to be discussed. And we have a, a Mr. Raghuraman who will be talking about it. And then we come to the crux of the issue. After all these discussions, where do we go? So we have our Ambassador K.C. Singh, who has seen Iran from the close quarters, talking about the road ahead. Subsequently, we will wind up with a discussion and possible recommendation before lunch. Of course, we intend to finish well before lunch. May I request Mr. Raghuraman to make his presentation? Everybody, Professor Ramurthy, colleagues and friends, it's indeed a great privilege for me to come here and share some of my thoughts on a subject very close to my heart and my own background, namely energy. Before going into the Iran, let's talk about the case of the oil pricing and also how people from 1970s have been talking about a day when the whole globe will run out of oil. And this is something we need to understand. When you had the Club of Rome limits to growth, they said in 1970s that world will run out of oil by 2000, and a lot of speculations have been there. And from every year, every year when we have seen the forecasts, every month there has been no correlation with respect to energy pricing or with respect to the case of the global reserves and production. In fact, in 2003, when we were at the World Petroleum Congress, it was said that we are going to have more of reserves than production. The BP chairman, uh, uh, this, uh, what do you call, Shell chairman made this statement. He lost his job after four years because the reserves were not what he thought would be. But then the question is, when 70s, you found the oil prices going up suddenly, yeah, the first oil crisis, we found that when people were talking about the world run out, running out of oil, was because of the near onshore fields. And it was not possible for you to get oil beyond $2 a barrel at that point of time. When it became $10 a barrel, it actually became possible for them to go for enhanced oil recovery and improved oil recovery by which it is possible to justify the $10 per barrel cost. Then we had the offshore. Then we had the deep water. With the result, we find that the world reserves have been going up. There have been really different sources provided we are prepared to pay. It is not the question of world running out of oil, but what we are prepared to pay and also what are the techniques we can use. For example, in the North Gujarat fields, ONGC had a recovery of just around 23 to 24%. Now, if they go for improved oil recovery, enhanced oil recovery, there are techniques where they can go up to 45, 50%. And that's actually a cost. At $2 a barrel, surely impossible. At $40 a barrel, maybe. Over $100 a barrel is something different. And also something has happened since 70s. Till 70s, natural gas was not considered as a great resource. It was being flagged. In fact, nobody thought of natural gas. And in fact, it happened in India also. When we had the natural gas flagged from the Bombay High, because we thought it was just an associated gas, could be flagged. And in fact, our ministry was rechristened the Ministry of Oil and Natural Gas, only in 1985 or so. Till then, it was only Ministry of Petroleum. 
because then only natural gas was considered a resource for planning and actually it was included with respect to developing the pipelines and others. <clears throat> with this background, we have to understand exactly what we are talking about when you are talking about the world running out of oil and also what is it we are talking about our dependence on global resources, especially hydrocarbon resources. I think with this background in mind, we should, I will be actually presenting some of the view graphs which you may like to really see and then probably question. Which is up here? Oh, here it is. Okay. Okay, yes. Okay. Actually, if you look at the map of uh, the Gulf, especially with respect to Iran, we find that most of the natural gas resources are around this area. Especially, you find the case of Qatar and also South Pars Field, which is of Iran, which is also close by. And this is the major natural gas resource. And then you find the kind of sea lanes which have been actually demarcated as per the international maritime law. And we have to see exactly how crowded the corridor is and how it is possible because 35% of the world's sea trade goes through this choke point and also that is 20% of the world's total oil exports. And we find that 70 million tons of LNG cargo also moves through this. So it's not a question of Iranian oil coming through the Gulf or the Iranian gas, if you want, but the question of even the RAS gas, which we have actually uh, contracted with Qatar, which comes through this. This is a major issue for us to understand. It is not just a question of Iranian oil, but also the shipping and the kind of disruptions which can occur if there are problems. And then, of course, you find that there is a case where you find that when Iran is bordering many of these, Iran also actually swaps gas and oil from Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, etc., and actually tries to see that the swap through that they are actually exporting through the uh, Strait of Amos. Now look at the proven uh, oil reserves of the world. This doesn't include US. Saudi Arabia has the maximum reserve, followed by Venezuela, then Canada, then Iran, then Iraq, Kuwait, United Arab Emirates, Russia, Libya, and Nigeria. Here, point to be noted here is that if Iran, which is the fourth largest reserves which it has, is not able to deliver. Today you are able to find that Iraqi oil fields are coming back on stream and they are supplying, plus Libya is already back. So it is a thing where it is possible for to balance out the Iranian drop in supply. And also Saudi Arabia is going to produce more. So with respect to resource endorsement, you find there is inert, adequate supply, what you call potential around the world. And the world consumption, which was 86 million barrels a day for 2008, actually is down to about 82 or so. This is mainly because of the conservation in US. And also we find within US, there has been increase in oil production. In fact, they have reversed the trend of increasing imports into U.S. from outside. That also will come back as to how it is so. That's also one of the reasons you find there's a big difference between the Brent oil and the NYMEX oil or the WTI, West Texas Intermediate, which hovered, used to hover, hover around $20, $25 a barrel. Of course, now it's narrowing down. But the point is very clear. Earlier, they used to be more or less close to each other. There was not such a big change or big difference in the NYMEX and the Brent crude. 
Now, if you look at the Iranian oil production, it was peak during 1977. But you see, there has been a significant drop after the revolution. It came down and the production somewhat went up, but it has never come up to the levels it was in 76. The reason is very clear, these are aging fields and they have not been able to rework or have enhanced oil recovery by which they will be able to get more of oil from the existing oil fields. They have not been develop, able to develop large oil fields since then. And also over a period of time you find that internal consumption is also rising. So that ability to export is getting constrained because of two reasons. They are not able to produce and they are not able to access technology for enhanced oil recovery, etc. And also we find that that internal consumption is also raising. So there are two things which I'd like to note here. One is with respect to the Iran-Iraq war. And surely you find here is a more of stagnation during this period. The lowest levels of production is around this period, which picked up actually and actually peaked around 1997 and then actually went up to 2000 because in this period oil prices around the world were very much dipped. They were less than $10 a barrel and they started going up and we found, they find that now they are leveled off and production is not increasing after 2009. Now if you look at the top export destinations for the Iranian oil, we find that China leads with 20%, Japan with 17%, that was in 2010, India 16%, Italy 10%, South Korea 9%, other 26 So you find that when it comes to the case of Iranian oil exports, we find that the dependence of U.S. is nil, and with Europe, the significant country was that of Italy, but it's not dependent on Iran oil, Iranian oil. In fact, Iranian oil is predominantly being imported by Asian countries, and that's a point to be noted here, because the reason is that we found that this was the case in 2010, but the picture changes because of sanctions and what has happened since then. If you look at the case of condensate and oil exports, this is from January to June 2011, that was 2010, we find that Italy, it was around 13%, Spain 13%, France 4%, Germany 1%, UK 1%, Netherlands 2 others. Japan, it is around about, actually they have reduced, if you look at from the point of view of Japan, is 10%, India 11%, South Korea 10 Turkey 51%, South Africa 25%, Sri Lanka 100%. You will see Sri Lanka is dependent on this for 100%, Taiwan 4%, China 11%. <clears throat> if you're looking at, people say, yes, China is against sanctions, but you find that Chinese have reduced their imports from Iran by about 50%. This we have to understand. People are saying as if we are buckled and it's India which has buckled and actually reduced its imports. The point is not that. It is a case of all the countries who have reduced. And when they have reduced, you find the case of Japan, Korea, they have got waivers of the sanctions of also 10 European countries, China and India have not got the waiver on the sanctions. That is the issue. Because you find that Japan is still going to continue its imports from Iran. And we find that apart from sourcing the crude, payment of the crude, we also have two things with respect to shipping as well as insurance. These two also will have to be secured. For this, you find Japan has already made a sovereign, actually, allotment of $8 billion to cover for insurance 
of the freight from Iran to Japan. So it's not as if Japan is shutting off its doors to Iranian oil imports. It is importing oil, similarly with South Korea, it is importing, but they have got the waiver. We haven't got the waiver. <clears throat> but also, you find that because U.S. has reduced its imports, it is when you find that the U.S. actually, the, the, what do you call, the envoy came here to really see as to exactly how India can reduce its dependence on Iranian imports, we find that today there are alternate avenues opening up as far as supply goes. Because Iraq production is really getting up. In fact, it is matching that of Iran now. And Libya is already on. And we find that India is importing more than 21% of its oil requirements from Africa, which includes countries such as Nigeria, Sudan, Algeria, other countries. So that is coming to 21.5%. And also we have the ONGC Videsh, which has got over of overseas acreages. And in 2009, 2010, we had a record, what do you call, impo, what do you call the ONGC resource crude of more than 9.5 million tons. But last year it came down by a million tons because of problems in Sudan, especially South Sudan, from which we have not been able to get the production. But there is a blueprint of ONGC Videsh which talks about a 20 million tons production which it can source from overseas assets by 2020 and probably it will go up to 35 million tons by 2030. That's one of actually securing overseas assets by ONGC alone. Apart from this, there have been private sector initiatives like Reliance, SR, Videocon and others who have also gone for acquiring overseas assets and these are also coming into fruition. And if you look at some of these cases, there have been where China has been gobbling up the reserves. There are also cases where India and China have collaborated and cooperated. Like in the case of Sudan and in Syria and it is quite possible that we will have both the regimes of competition as well as cooperation or cooperation between China and India because many of these resources which are available are in risk prone areas with political volatility and also problems with respect to ethnic strifes. Like in the case of Sudan it is the Christians versus the Muslim population. Similarly in Nigeria I think these kinds of things we should be really prepared to face with, and these are risk-prone areas. Similarly, in the case of Russia, for example, ONGC got a, pro uh, got a property called the Imperial Energy. That was four years back. And people said, you got it at a very high price. There's a lot of problem on that. At that time, it looked quite OK. But today, after getting that, you find that Russian authorities are putting all sorts of spokes in developing the field and also which we have. So these are risky areas whether they are going to give us the right kind of what we call returns. Why we are saying is Iran is prolific. It has got huge resources and it is just near our background and we are not able to access that but we are going for farther areas. Probably we will be able to get them but at a price and also with less certainty. Similar is the case with the risks in Iran as well. Because in Iran is whether to be or not to be. The question is we do not know exactly how things are going to pan out, whether we will be in a position to meet the kind of disruptions because in the state of Hormuz, anything happens, it's not going to be that, it's going to be Qatar gas, it's going to be others. And it's not easy for us to find alternate LNG route from there. Of course, with respect to oil, today you have the Fujira pipeline, and then you have others by which you have the Baku, Tbilisi, Shehan pipeline. It's possible for us to get some diverted oil, but surely these are all things which are not going to solve the problem immediately. This is one part of it. Of course, we'll come to the other part as to when we start replacing 
the Iranian crude with other crudes. What are the kinds of problems? We'll come to that later. Now, another point is, you look at the Iranian refining capacity. One of the problems is Iran is having so much of resource, but they do not have the right kind of technologies and skill sets by which they will be able to meet their own requirements inside the country. In fact, they are importing 78,000 barrels per day of gasoline. That corresponds to about 5 million tons of gasoline per year. If you look at that, why they are not able to do so? The refineries, they are not able to process because they do not have the contractors and others, because of sanctions, are able to work the refineries to the right capacities for which they are intended, and that's something which is they are looking for product imports from different countries, and they are looking at Turkey, Azerbaijan, so many other sources by which they will be able to get the imports. Because we find that today, because the Asian Clearing Union, it's not possible for us to go and get the money through that and have the entire transaction in dollars, which means that we have to go through different kinds of mechanisms. Many countries also have to do that same thing because they will not be able to go through the dollar mechanism of repayment. This is the crux of the problem is repayment and also how we can have shipping arranged along with the insurance and who is going to actually take the cost because there are a lot of risks associated with getting the Iranian oil shipped. Now look at another thing, a similar case with the natural gas reserves. It's a huge reserve, which is Russia is number one, Iran number two. But of course it doesn't look at US, because this is something which US has not included is shale gas, and you find that shale gas has transformed the entire US scene, and also natural gas, if you look at any of these gas reserves, will have to be reversed, revised uh, <coughs> drastically, because you find which was U.S., which was a US net importer of gas, in fact, is importing gas, we find it's now actually able to export. There is so much of overproduction. The natural gas prices have really dipped to below production costs of $2.5 a million BTU, while the international price, is a, it used to be more than $16, which is now $16 a million BTU. In fact, it has gone up earlier, and the Henry have prices more than $20, $25 in 2007, 8, etc. Today, within U.S., you don't have this kind of price fluctuation, which means that U.S. is in a different type of a mode with respect to the, it is totally insulated from the world and the prices because it doesn't have to depend on any imported natural gas. It's something, and in fact, India, Gale, has gone into an agreement with the North, North uh, American gas uh, players to import LNG to India. And it has actually drawn a 25-year contract. So people may wonder, what is it we are going to get from there? Why from such a distance? Surely we may think of swaps with Japan and South Korea so that we are able to get what they are able to get down here and swap it with the Siberian gas as well as the North, North American gas. So this will be, this is the change circumstance. Similarly, with respect to the case of the oil production in U.S., where it has actually increased its production, declined, de declining imports, so we find a different type of scenario which is working out. The problem with the U.S. is they are the East Coast refineries which cannot process their own crude which they get from Canada and others because they don't have the pipeline to carry from Oklahoma flushing to these refineries. In fact, they have not been built for that. So what the result, the East Coast refineries are actually running dry. That's why they have to import the products today, which they do. But probably over a period of time, the Keystone Pipeline, when it comes into being, that's what the Republicans are wanting, that the pipeline should be built. And to the getting the pipeline to East Coast, there is no problem. They'll be able to do so. Problem is with respect to Alaska side, where there are a lot of environmental concerns. And Canada is also looking at finding other people to market its own oil. That's either Japan as well as China. So this is something which is being debated in the U.S. and it will be a good election, <coughs> actually, rhetoric for them because this is something which has a lot of implication 
on U.S. And U.S. is also very clear that they are going to have energy independence by 2025, 2030. They don't have to depend on any oil from outside or gas. So this is something which is a new scenario. This will only change provided the environmentalists get more active and say the fracking is giving them more of contaminated water. And there are also reports that there have been some minor seismic activities in those fracking areas, which may actually dampen. And people are also fearing that if they are going to have more of regulation, that's also a possibility. That's the U.S. side of the picture. But in Europe, they have been very conservative, and they have not allowed any fracking. And you find that in England, they had some one fracking which was done. They had some seismic activity. They may close down. Same thing in France and others. They have not been able to get. And the one country where they did in Poland, they have not been able to get any gas. So Europe is a case where shale gas has not made much ground. It is in the U.S. which has made now and transformed. So this is another question. We'll have to keep whether this is going to really solve, whether it's a temporary thing, whether environmentalists really take over, take over and create different scenes. Because in the U.S., because of climate change implications, they actually now will wean away from coal, and natural gas is a very good substitute for them. And we find that natural gas is also going to substitute that entire trucking. Trucking is changing over to LNG. So you find that there is a big transformation occurring within the U.S. Now, if you look at from the Iranian natural resources, because they have to develop these resources. For that, they need technology. They need skill sets. And that's where there's going to be a problem. It's like, you know, I have got all the resources, like in India, we got the coal, so much of resource. But if you look at Indian coal reserves, it's more than 100 billion tons. Well, Indonesia is having only 100 gigatons. While in the case of, let's take Indonesia, it's got only 5 gigatons. And it has got a population which is only one-fifth of India. And we find that we are developing Indonesian coal mines. We are able to develop Indonesian coal mines, not Indian coal mines. It's just like our own internal problems. It's the case with Iran. With so much of things, they are not able to bring it out because you find that they are not able to get technology and the sanctions are really hurting them. This is also the case. You look at their electricity plants. They got actually capacities added. And we find that most of the natural gas combined cycle plants are working at 10% load factor. There's a problem with respect to accessing spares, accessing and also running them. And this is something which is not just because of oil. How are they going to manage? Second, they have been supplying gasoline at 10 cents, and which has been increased to today, ration category, 40 cents. And it will be... 70 cents for those who consume above that, which is so low, the kind of, the, what do you call the charges they are doing with respect to a gallon of uh, gasoline. So it's not possible for you to have this kind of rates and then see to it that they are able to actually, see, what do you call, see the public is kept under guard because if they import gasoline, they have to pay the market price. And if you look at their entire economy, the $73 billion they got as uh, export revenue, that's the net revenue, it's 50% of the GDP. And if you look at from the point if the price of oil go down or they're not able to export, surely they are in a squeeze. And whether they will be able to maintain this low gasoline price to their actually public and whether they will be able to meet any uh, public outrage when the prices increase. This is another issue which we need to keep in mind. Actually, another thing which you have to find that a uh, lot of gas, because you're not able to have the way of actually getting them uh, liquefied or transported, they reject re the gas into the oil, oil wells. And then it is possible, if they get the technology, they can use it for enhanced oil recovery, but actually pushing this gas in by which they will be able to reduce the viscosity of the oil and actually pump up the oil. And today, that's the case. If that is the case, the re-injected gas will also go down. So this is something probably it's also waiting for technology to actually come to Iran by which they will be able to increase their oil production 
as well as have better utilization of natural gas. And then we have to say they have got a very good network of natural gas pipelines inside the country, and it is also linked to Azerbaijan, other kinds of things in the Caspian Sea. So, and also with Turkey, they have got an oil pipeline to actually transport oil to Turkey. So there is a good amount of infrastructure over there, but how long, how far they will be maintained is a question. Of course, I don't want to go into this. Uh, but one thing which we'll have to say here is, surely you look at the India-Pakistan, Iran-Pakistan-India pipeline, is the most logical offshoot. And a lot of things have been done even before the sanctions. We are never able to actually agree on a price level, as we have done with Turkmenistan now. And it was always stuck on the case of how to get the oil gas in. In fact, Dr. Kirit Parekh and others have already given some alternate ways by which we can have the kind of energy security to India so that if Pakistan does something, how we can actually prevent that so that we won't have any shortage of gas. He calls it MAD, that is mutually agreed destruction, which means that you have the Iran pipeline come to the uh, Rajasthan border and you have the main pipeline, main wall over there, through that it goes to Lahore. And then from Lahore it goes and supplies. The idea will be if anything happens, India can throttle the wall over here. That means the question is, is the case of actually seeing to it that it's enough security for the pipeline. But the problem is we have not been able to agree to a price and we have been dithering all the time. And India has already had the bitter experience of Indian Oil Corporation we they had, as I told you yesterday, a 5 million tons of LNG just contracted when, uh, in 2004 5. And they said, no, we, yeah, and they agreed, the MOU was signed. And after six months, they said, no, no, we have a new government and we are not able to ratify. So they were not able to give us the kind of price on which we had signed the MOU. And this is the major problem with respect to the trust between the two countries, and it has been the problem of, you know, going up and down over a period of time. We have not been able to solve this. It is not a problem of today, but it has been a problem which has been there last eight, nine years. So it is not a thing which is only coming with sanctions of today. The other thing we have to understand with respect to the oil prices, is there a trend we find that if you look at this West Texas Intermediate Grude Oil, which is the NYMEX, and then the Brent Crude, we find that there's a correlation with respect to differential. We find that always there's a differential, and the differential is more or less maintained, and there have been cases where they have narrowed down. It all depends on the kind of inventories held by U.S. and what they are prepared to actually release. In fact, after Katrina, they released their strategic reserve, some of it. And U.S. has that luxury of releasing that, and it is possible to influence short-term prices. Or depends on the winter in U.S. and how the heating oil and others. But today, because of natural gas, the heating oil requirements are pretty much down. So we find that this kind of differential which is there, which is existing now, will continue for times to come. But if you look at, looked at this five years back, probably you would not have had any much difference between the two WTI and Brent oil. And you find when you're trading day, you find that there is something called a churn. That is 225 times the volume of the oil is traded non-physically, that is virtually electronically, rather than the physical trade. And that is what creates the volatility in the, in the system because people who take future positions do not want to lose. And we find there's a lot of speculation with respect to short-term oil markets. And this is something that's why every day it is getting influenced. In the case of natural gas, the churn is 75 times in the issue of the Henry hub. But today it has less significance because of the U.S. gas, because U.S. is the biggest consumer, 
and it makes a lot. Second thing we have to understand that since 2008, when petrol, the uh, gasoline prices there went to over four dollars a gallon, we found that 2009, 2010, they reduced their gasoline consumption and the petroleum consumption came down, which was exactly equivalent to the entire Indian consumption of petroleum products. So that's the kind of margin which they have. That's why 86 billion, million barrels a day came down to 82 million barrels a day. That's what we have to understand, that U.S. has the capability and the ability to actually make with price, price uh, signals. And also in U.S., the price also varies. Today, you find that the lowest price is $3.24 a gallon, while it is more than 424 in some states. So there's a big variation within the U.S. with respect to the case of gas prices. And of course, this has a lot of meaning for President uh, Obama's re-election next year. It's going to be a major election plank, and surely gasoline prices are the ones which really have and make the U.S. Uh, presidency to a good extent. Now, actually, if you look at the historical oil price spreads, you find that, yes, as we said, that the lowest point was coming around nearly less than $10. Highest point is more than $20. So you find that there are people who hedge Brent against WTI, where they can switch over, whatever it may be, where they can. But today, those opportunities are getting less and less because of the U.S. dependence coming down. And of course, these are all things I just don't want to go through that. But the issue is one of historical and implied volatility. Nobody can predict one month later what is going to be the crude price. And I don't think there has been a single speculation or single what you call forecast which has been able to picture this or try to say that it is going to be around this level. If you look at the case of Goldman Sachs, Goldman Sachs, they mentioned in 2008, before the financial crisis, that oil may touch $200 a barrel by 2008 or 2009. It didn't happen. In fact, 2009, it crashed to $35, $40 because of the financial crisis. So I think this is something highly speculative. It is not very much actually to do with the kind of because consumption levels have been more or less stable and they have not gone up. And also reserves to production ratio around the world have not gone up because there have been new finds outside the OPEC. Brazil, there is a huge offshore find. And also we find that there are many of these because U.S. has now, actually after the Macondo Bay spill gate, which was there two years back, they have actually reversed their stand on deep water drilling. And also you have Mexico, you have many other parts where you are going to get good amount of oil. We'll have to see exactly how they pan out because there have been a lot of accidents which have occurred because they are not reported like the Macondo Bay. There have been offshore platforms which have actually collapsed in offshore in Brazil as well as in Venezuela. In fact, one of our own Aban offshore had one of its offshore platform go under in Venezuela. So there are a lot of imponderables over there because it's a highly risky business, one of deep water drilling. And then, and then the other point which we have to understand is that uh, there have been energy efficiency gains because of climate change and other kinds of influences. And we find today Tata Prius, Toyota Prius, the hybrid car, especially the one with fuel cell, which was not doing well, it is actually now number three topmost seller. For 15 years, they were never seeing any actually uh, increase in sales. So you find that there is going to be a really reduction in gasoline consumption over a period of time because of hybrids, electric vehicles coming in time in, in, into the fold. And also you have lithium batteries, which are going to bring much more efficiency and more uh, energy density for the same kind of uh, for less weight. So I think there are a lot of things which are occurring. That's why you find that UAE and others, why UAE goes for a nuclear $20 billion 
actually contract with the Koreans because very clear that oil may not be able to sustain them in the long term future. They have to actually diversify and it's not possible for any country to actually see to it in these kinds of troubled times and also volatile situation to bank on the oil prices and people will have to really diversify their economies. That's why they are trying to see that they go for nuclear renewables, other kinds of things, because solar city is getting built in Abu Dhabi. The RENA Renewable Energy Agency is in Abu Dhabi. So there are many things which are happening around, which is not, which shows that even those oil rich and hydrocarbon rich resource countries are looking at diversifying. The other issues with respect to Africa, look at Africa, whole of Nigeria, in fact, the kind of contamination of the Niger Delta is something which BP, Shell, and have, Shell have totally not looked at the environment, and it is actually terrible with respect to the environmental devastation which has happened here. One day people are really going to turn their attention on that. And already today in those areas, kidnapping and actually the uh, question of getting the oil pipelines actually getting uh, flared up, all these things are happening over there. So these are troubled areas, but surely areas in which we will be concentrating because it's definitely important for us to see that we actually diversify our resources and try to see how we can actually contain the Iranian actually isolation. But it will be, it will be in our interest and we will do our best as far as we can actually as a country, as we see as a citizen, because we have traditional links with Iran and we have the real energy potential over there, and we would like to see exactly how we can get over the sanctions or how we can engage ourselves with Iran this is something very important. Because we look at from the point of view of payment, what happened? RBI suddenly said that we will not have any Asian clearing union and we will not be able to give you anything with the dollar payment through this mechanism. So what happened? Then the oil companies went to, through the German route and the German bank was giving the right kind of facility and that was also getting, was throttled. Then we said we'll go to the Turkey route and also Turkey because Turkey is something which wants and it is against sanctions and surely Turkey was a thing but it was not adequate. So what has happened? Gazprom, US, Russia has been able to help us and today we have no outstanding with Iran because it has been settled through that, but how long will this continue? That's why we have been urging Iran to go for rupee payment by which rupee can be accepted for actually the Iranian imports and today they have come round and said yes, we can have about 45% of the imports from Iran with rupee. Uh, and rupee, and they are also trying to increase exports from India, especially like basmati rice and others, and wheat. So we would like to see exactly how this works out. But the other 55% will have to come through the Russian, the Turkey, other kinds of routes. The other thing is, of course, not only, one as I said, the question of crude pricing, but also with respect to the case of shipping and insurance. Is the case of our national because we cannot have a sovereign guarantee just like that of the Japan, because we are in the balance of payment trade, we are negative in the sense that our imports are far, far exceeding our exports and we have a huge uh, deficit and it's not possible for us to have and we'll have to find out ways and means whether we'll be able to give sovereign guarantee, whether we'll be able to take that and for our shipping route because reinsurance is not possible and that will be throttled. And that's the case, we'll have to know the shipping and the insurance costs are also to be taken into account whatever Iranian oil we are going to get. So that's another thing we'll have to see as to how we can do this over the wrong run. This is another challenge for us and we have to keep this in mind. But of course I think here the way by which we can engage with BRICS especially Brazil, because Brazil is one country which has been, when President Lula came, he was quite against the sanctions and the type of things and he made bold statements. Similarly, Turkey has also done. 
Turkey is not a brick country, but surely we can have some ways and engage with them. And probably we are engaging also with those countries to see exactly how we can solve this problem. And we have had some talk, especially in our own ways, I'm not talking about the official routes, like Japan and Korea, as to how they are meeting and what is it we can learn from their experience to see that we will be able to make Iranian oil flow to us and uh, while we are reducing, we can't do that. Now, the last point I want to make here is every refinery cannot process any type of crude because there are crude which are high in wax, like your Bombay high is so high in wax, actually at room temperature it will be like a candle because pore point is 65 degrees centigrade. So you need actually like the cane oil when it actually came out from Rajasthan, our Indian Oil Corporation has said, we will not take the crude from you. They are very high in wax. And in fact, they had to have tankers with actually special uh, insulation so that it can carry till the pipeline was built. And the pipeline is heated. And pipeline, if it is not heated, the whole thing will be a huge candle. So the thing is very clear. It's a high pore point waxy crude. But our crude is very low in sulfur. Why in the case of the Iranian crude which you are getting is very high in sulfur. And you find that you have a desulfurization unit where you have to actually take the sulfur out and you may actually even convert it to elemental sulfur as they do in, in uh, uh, <clears throat> this, uh, what do you call our uh, uh, Reliance refinery. But it requires certain quantities so that you can actually economically produce them. Second point is the kind of processing you have. In fact, the earlier refineries like Madras refineries and others they were planned for with fluid FCCs, fluid catalytic crackers, which actually maximize the production of gasoline. But what we require in India is a middle display, that is diesel and kerosene, for which we need hydro cracker. And hydro crackers were not put up in these refineries, because earlier Russian refineries, they didn't even have secondary processing. The only refineries which can take up these which have got the high complexity of taking any type of crude is that of Reliance Refinery and also SR which can take up any type of crude and convert them because they have that kind of complexity with which it's possible because they got all sorts of secondary processes and also they got huge sizes like 33 million tons. Our old refineries like this which have been expanded over a period of time is like padding which they come to 9 million tons etc. I don't think they are capable of handling this. So it is a question is, now Reliance will not be able to take any Iranian crude. We have some very funny situations. While we may be able to manage, provided we are able to divert these to Reliance, because Reliance is a private sector, and they will not be able to do. In fact, they have not been able to export gasoline to Iran. So there are many imponderables, difficulties with respect to the case of utilizing our own refining capacity within the country, though we are able to utilize the non-Iranian crude. For example, the refinery in Jamnaga, they get the worst crude from Venezuela at a very long-term contract, which was $25 a barrel with some sort of, uh, what do you call, variation. And they converted the most clean fuel and export to the U.S. market. So the point is one of technology, capacities, and the way you are able to plan your complexities. And this was not actually the, kept in mind while devising the, or putting up refineries in Madras or in Mangalore, etc. They were of a different genre. And also they were for self-sufficiency with building refining capacity in the country rather than going for global markets as has been done with Reliance. And today one of the highest uh, foreign exchange earners is petroleum product exports. We talk about imports, but mostly if you look at more than 30, 35 million tons of products are being exported, and that's giving us the net, actually the oil import as $130 billion. Otherwise, we would have been going and marketing around the world for kerosene and diesel, which we used to do every year, and we used to actually push up the global prices. Today it has been done, and people used to ask me, why are they putting up so much capacity? Isn't it a big risk? It was a big risk when they put up the refineries. In fact, they were getting negative margins. 2003, 2004, Indian oil was not going to take up their actually, product, production from Jamnagar refinery. But it was like richy rich 
Suddenly the world, whole thing changed. Katrina came. You found that they really boomed and their product prices, they were able to get huge export volumes. I think these are some of the things that are highly business risk oriented and we have to understand how they'll pan out. But it's definitely possible, probably, there, is also, there are also reports that in Iran, the refineries are being upgraded. I don't know how, but that is a feeling. And also, they say, by 2016-17, they will not, they don't have to import any gasoline. So these are all speculations, how they are going to get the technology, how they are going to work out, and these are all situations which we need to keep in mind. With this, I think I would like to stop and take questions.